Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to the most interesting people. And we've got one for you today. A New Zealander who fought for Rolf Harris's freedom. For the last two years, he spent his life tirelessly going through case by case and accusation by accusation, which has resulted in Rolf being free two and a half years early. I'm joined on the line by William Merritt. How are you? Fine, thanks, Alex. We should describe you as a private investigator. That's what you do, isn't it? What do you do then? So I hire you for what purpose? Well, I do specialist work, so I'm, I'm a little bit choosy about what I do. And I don't mean to sound snobby over that. It's just that the word private investigator can be, I can relate to just about anything, uh, from a debt collector to uh, someone who looks through bedroom windows. What I do is a specialist either criminal work or insurance work. So I guess when you were approached by the Harris legal team, you had a choice to make whether you wanted to work with him. Why did you decide to do that? I had just finished the Dave Lee Travis case, and a lot of the charges against Rolf Harris uh, were almost identical, except perhaps for a couple of the uh, the people involved were, um, were younger, uh, as Dave Lee Travis. And I looked through the evidence. I spent about an hour and a half going through the evidence. And uh, it was after that that I decided that the police had just not carried out a proper investigation. Uh, and uh, it really needed a full investigation to um, check the credibility of some of the witnesses. Operation U Tree doesn't exist anymore. The Met got rid of that. Do you think that whole thing became a witch hunt, naming and shaming celebrities and sort of making them out to be something different from the truth? Like I think many, many other people, I, I do think that. Uh, having now looked at both DLT and Rolf Harris, not just looked at them, been, but been more involved than anyone else, uh, it was quite obvious that it was a, a, a witch hunt. Uh, as to who was involved in organising this, I don't know, but uh, the success rate was very, very poor. Certainly the standard of evidence was very low. Uh, and not just myself, but uh, one of the investigators that was working with me, who was a retired detective superintendent, the first time he looked at the uh, evidence, he, he, he asked me, he says, what, what is happening? <laughs> Why were these people even charged in the first place? Uh, and the witnesses were not checked out. Uh, the first thing you would do as a detective is you would check the credibility of your witness. You don't have to look deep into their background, but you do some very basic checks just to see if these witnesses are telling you the truth. And I'm not just talking about complainants here. I'm talking about, talking about witnesses who came forward and were used by the police to try and um, back up the uh, allegations made by the complainants. I guess in the Met's defence, there were many accusers for both men, DLT and Rolf Harris. Does that make you more nervous when there isn't just an isolated case as there was in the instance of Sir Cliff Richard? In these cases, there were many cases, and certainly with Rolf um, of late, more have come forward, most of which you've had thrown out of court. That must be intimidating because they've got the might of the police behind them and you've just got yourself to sort the whole thing out. It was very intimidating. Uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say, when I looked at it, I thought to myself, what am I going to do here? I just can't believe it. I don't think there's anyone that I know that has ever been involved in a historic allegations as far back as 40 odd years with so many people coming forward. Uh, it was very daunting. Have you put your finger on why somebody would make an accusation that isn't true and can easily be proved that it wasn't true? That's the thing none of us can understand. Why would these women make accusations if they weren't true? They did not realise that this was going to go before a criminal court. I think the publicity that was surrounding, it was uh, the, the police virtually threw the fly paper out and uh, they were just looking for people to come forward and, and stick to the fly paper. It's as simple as that. And hundreds and hundreds came forward. They picked uh, a number and they thought, right, if this person is 
saying uh, that this particular incident occurred and this person is saying something similar occurred, then they can't all be wrong. And that's the tactic they use. They cannot all be wrong. But the problem was you had no win, no fee lawyers on television, on daytime television saying, look, come forward, you will be believed. They had the police saying, we will believe you. I think they thought that all they had to do was to come forward, make a complaint, make a statement, then they would either get a payout or whatever else they were looking for. Mm. And it wasn't just money involved. At this point, I mean, I know you're incredibly damning of the CPS and the way that they've operated this entire system. Do you think if these accusations were made today, they would be dealt with differently? Do you think they've even learnt their own lessons? Because it seemed to me there was so much hype around U-Tree that it sort of had its own energy, that, that the truth was almost lost, certainly in those cases that have been proved to be complete lies. Yeah, well, it's very easy to be critis- uh, to criticise the CPS or the police. Uh, certainly in the later trials of Royal Paris, you couldn't criticise the CPS. You couldn't criticise the court. They handle it very professionally. Uh, I was impressed. I think everyone was impressed. It was at, in the early stages, the people that were involved then, they were swept along. Uh, and if you look at them now, they've all gone. Mm. They've moved on. They've either resigned, retired, uh, and moved elsewhere, or most of them have. Uh, why? Well, only they could answer that. But someone was pulling the strings upstairs. Someone was telling them they must get convictions and they were looking for some big name celebrities to make up for what they had missed out with Savile. And that became very apparent the more I more I investigated. Was it your belief from day one that Rolf Harris was innocent and that it was your job to prove that? Because I know in the first trial there was almost no defence, was there? Yes, well, I wasn't involved uh, in that first trial. I came along after the convictions, and uh, uh, there is an appeal in process at the moment as a result of investigations that I did. Uh, and, of course, we had the eight new charges uh, that I was looking into. Uh, from day one, I didn't know. Um, I, I grew up with Rolf Harris, um, thought he was fantastic. But that had no bearing on it. Perhaps it was because I had been involved with the David Lee Travis case and seen the same type of complaints and the same type of complainant. So I did look at it. It, it, it was daunting, but not as daunting as perhaps the DLT one was, uh, because I think we had 14 uh, charges there. Uh, and because I already had, had read virtually the same type of complaint, but just from a different person. When you've got something like DLT in front of you, 14 of the 15 were acquitted. How do you disprove something that happened 30 years ago? It seems like, from a layman's point of view, an impossible task because you're having to find evidence on something that doesn't exist. Perhaps it's like climbing a huge mountain. You look at the mountain and you think, how will I ever get to the top of that? All you've got to do is in stages and you've just got to start at the bottom and just knock it off one at a time and go through it and start looking at each ca- each charge. It sometimes becomes very, very difficult, particularly with Rolf Harris, in that you've got lots of people contacting you. He had a huge, huge support group out there. You have to talk to these people. You've got to discuss it with them. And then, of course, you're involved in one of the particular investigations on one of the complaints. You've got to skip to another one and then another one and then try and get back... So for the first few months, it was very, very difficult. But once we got into a, a system, uh, it's one by one, and you've got to do the research. Um, probably the better way of answering this is you've got to put yourself back to how it was in the 60s and 70s when this offence occurred. You've got to picture what the people were like, what was happening back then, and then start looking for those people if they're still around. Um, Like one of the cases, we had to find an old police station uh, that no one even knew existed, not even the Metropolitan Police knew it existed. But once we found the police station, uh, where it was, uh, 
we actually found policemen that were there at the time, and of course they ended up being excellent witnesses, but no one knew they existed. Mm. Just to be clear then on the DLT case, that was the first most high profile case that you're involved in with regards to yew tree. Is your belief, you mentioned earlier about these no win, no fee people, do you think the women lied or do you think something happened but it wasn't what they said happened, just so we're clear on that? It varied. Uh, it, it's very difficult overall because most of them had different reasons. Uh, but if you had, a, we had one uh, group of three women who came forward. Two of them did not want to come forward, but they were... Um, they, they were encouraged, or more than encouraged, by a very dominant woman. She came forward. Now, an incident did occur. There was an incident, but nothing like what she described. And it certainly wasn't involving any sexual or indecent assault. It was an incident. She took exception to that. It obviously had a grudge for many, many years. When she had the opportunity, she came forward. And she exaggerated what had happened. Fortunately, we were able to find witnesses, including two of the women that she brought along to um, assist her, who were able to give evidence to say, no, that is not what happened. Hmm. I mean, the woman said, for instance, she was wearing a dress uh, and that, um, you know, he, he touched her leg. When in fact, we later found out, and this was proven, she w never wore dresses on the day of this argument or the situation. She was wearing trousers. Right. Uh, yeah, but to find that out was very difficult. It's it's all right sitting here now saying we're you know it sounds simple, but it wasn't simple because we had to go back a long way, talk to a lot of people just to find that little bit of information. I don't know whether you can or wish to talk about the DLT case as he stands now. I, I believe his life has been totally ruined by it. I certainly know his career has. He's never worked since. And there was just one case uh, that you weren't able to clear him over. Th this is devastating to people's lives, isn't it? And I suppose in the DLT case, 14 of the 15 were thrown out. You're never proved innocent. You're not proven guilty. I, I suppose that's the problem, isn't it? The old saying, there's no smoke without fire. This stuff does devastate lives forever. Yes. Well, there were 14 charges and 14 acquittals. The 15th one was brought during a retrial when the, the jury had difficulty deciding on two. And at that stage, uh, a, this other one was suddenly brought against him. Now, it was interesting because after the acquittal, uh, a detective came up to Dave, shook his hand, and actually said to them, uh, it's not all over yet. Mm. Uh, and all of a sudden this other charge came. Uh, yeah, I'd love to talk about it. Um, he was found guilty on it, but the people behind the charge, uh, let, let's be honest, uh, you know, the, the um, DLT often said to me, I would like to just be able to sit face to face with that woman and talk to her and just say, why did you, why did you do this? Mm. Do you have sympathy that she may feel that she was attacked and that she did the honourable thing by going to the police? Knowing what I know, she never went to the police. No, she never went to the police. The police found her. Right. Um, she never went to the police at all. Uh, she was found and located. Uh, do I have sympathy? Knowing what I know, I have no sympathy. Mm. Uh, if she had been attacked, I'd have every sympathy. When I was a, a young detective in New Zealand, I had a very good reputation for catching rapists uh, and getting convictions. Uh, I even got a, a commendation by, from a judge uh, for it. I had no time for sexual predators uh, or people who um, attacked women. I saw that I had two, uh, three daughters and I've certainly got no time for them. But I certainly also have no time for someone uh, who uh, who um, makes a complaint knowing knowing that she's exaggerated, and it was quite clear. But unfortunately, he um, he was found guilty. 
the Court of Appeal refused to accept any new evidence, and um, that was it. And the poor man's life suffered because of it. Mm. And is there any hope you can ever get that back in court to try and have it overturned, or is that done now? No, nothing is ever done. I think uh, if anyone did it, it would have to be probably me driving it because um, Dave is just, he'd love to. Uh, but yes, I, I would like to um, do something about it. Uh, as to what we do, I don't know. I've only just finished two years on the Rolf Harris case, so mm. I'm having a little bit of a break. But when I've had a break, we will have a look at it and uh, see if there's anything we can do because... Um, uh, one day, I, uh, you know, I've, if someone actually came and have a look, had a look at the evidence that was there, uh, particular, particularly on a radio station, saying that uh, he was a really nice man, and if he did touch touch me um, on my breast, then uh, it must have been an accident. And then later on, how this man allegedly grabbed her, um, you know, the world's gone mad, and anyone that reads it and looks at it, say, well. Why was he ever convicted? Hmm. And we should say, I mean, he's lost everything. He's lost his career. He's lost his health. He's lost everything. Yeah, he has. His health spared. Um, yeah. The only good thing that he's got is his wife, hmm. who has, has stood by him the whole time and, um, and will continue to stay with him because she knows that this was, you know, it, it, it was considered by the court a minor situation. Uh, he... You know, he got a, a suspended sentence, um, but it was still a conviction. Mm. And it was so sad, the whole thing. And a conviction that's cost him his house as well. I mean, all of this doesn't come cheap. There is that issue, isn't there, that when you've got an infinite pot of money like the police have compared to these people, Jim Davison spoke very openly about the cost, the financial cost of clearing his name. Some people just don't have the money to do this. Again, th th there's got to be an issue there, hasn't there, that obviously if people have committed a crime, they should be sent down. But if they haven't, they should be able to prove their innocence. What does concern me is the number of people who are actually in jail, convicted, who are in there for very similar offences and who didn't have the money to hire someone like me. Uh, not that I, I, I cost a fortune, but the point is they just didn't have the money. Uh, and one day I was going to the internet doing some uh, in, inquiries in one of the uh, one of the Rolf Harris cases, and I it was an evening and I started trolling through, and I could not believe the number of relatives and friends and people who were talking about um, their relatives and friends, uh, or one of them that has been convicted is in jail and looking for someone to assist them uh, and saying, look, they're not guilty. Uh, we only hear about the celebrities. Uh, we don't hear about all the other people who are actually in jail and being convicted. And mm -hmm. it's not an easy job uh, getting the evidence that's required to defend it. And then you've got to have a good, a good barrister, a good QC, um, which unfortunately um, some of them don't have. There were eight cases in December that you have had cleared and Rolf Harris is now at home. Is your intention now to look at those cases that were prior to your engagement with Rolf Harris and clear those one by one? Is that what you're hoping to do? We've already looked at them. That's, that was my, uh, they were my first instructions. Uh, we haven't looked at all of them, but we've looked at uh, uh, three of them and they're the subject of an appeal at the moment. So the appeal was put in, I think, around January or after the January trial, not long after. So really, at the moment, I'm doing, I've got nothing more to do until after the uh, appeal court has um, come back with its decision. And then I'll, I'll, I'll see if there's any further instructions. But at the moment, my job is finished. With the knowledge you have, do you believe Rolf Harris is an innocent man that has been accused of things that he hasn't done? Yes. And I can prove that. And well, it was pr proven in court. Uh, well, put it this way, they couldn't, they couldn't prove that he did it in court. 
uh, he was he was acquitted on some, and the jury couldn't reach a verdict on the other. And after two attempts, so therefore the judge ruled not guilty on all charges. He was not guilty. He didn't uh, he didn't do what he was accused of. Uh, as far as the first ones go, I uh, I certainly know um, about two or three. I can't comment on them because they're subject of an appeal and that would be very wrong of me to do. Are you proud of the work you've done so far with Rolf? I mean, it's your work effectively that has got him out of jail at this point because had those cases, the eight in December, been found guilty, he'd almost certainly be still there and the sentence would have been extended, I presume. Uh, Yes, I am very proud of of what I've done. Uh, I had um, three other... Uh, investigators working with me uh, at times four um, and of course we had the odd investigator in other countries who would work on contract on specific points uh, we I'm very proud of what we what we the evidence we gathered uh, however the end result of course is down to the QC and the barrister uh, they're the ones that have to put it across to the court so um, I suppose as they say we provide the ammunition and they, they, they aim and pull the trigger. <laughs> mm. And what has the personal toll been on you? Because I know you've been working relentlessly for the last two years. Has it taken a toll on your health and your mental well-being? I'd like to think my mental well-being is all right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's starting to come, I'm, I'm starting to come out of it now. It has affected me. I've put on a bit of weight. I've lost my fitness and I've always been a typical New Zealander. Uh, enjoyed my rugby, enjoyed my um, all my boxing and my running and everything else, and my bike bike riding. That's all had to be put aside. So it has affected me, and uh, I've got to try and find a little bit of health back uh, and fitness. But it, it does take a toll. Um, yes, uh, you know I'd be lying if it didn't. But you know that's the nature of the business. It was two years on Rolf was really too long, non-stop. It would have. Um, DLT was less time because we came in on it late but two years with that that type of subject and dealing with a lot of the people we had to deal with was not pleasant not pleasant at all If you'd like to get in contact with William Merritt, you can go to meritinternational.com. That's his website, meritinternational.com. And I want to thank you for your time today, giving us insight into your last four or five years. You have been responsible, certainly in the last six months, of getting Rolf Harris out of jail. And I think that will go down in the history books. William Merritt, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot.